Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Gail Kong, President of the Asian Pacific Fund, an organization that promotes the health and well-being of all Asian Americans in the Bay Area. Gail Kong founded the fund in 1993 and has been an ardent advocate for people in need and for Asian communities in America. She previously headed New York City's Foster Care and Child Abuse Agency and the New York City Demonstration Program for what became AmeriCorps. Gail has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Gail, for taking the time to join with us. Thank you. Take us back to the time when you founded the Asian Pacific Fund in 1993 and, and the, the thought process that, that uh, resulted in, in the establishment of, of the organization, if you will. Sure. Um, I think that there were several things. Um, having worked in my whole career in mainstream social services, I could see that the issues for Asian Americans were not very well understood. And the demographics are a little bit challenging. In the, we tend to live in um, metropolitan areas. So at least a decade ago, 90% of Asians lived on the two coasts. And so you have concentration of Asians where we have a sense of what the issues are, the problems, the challenges for the poor and disenfranchised, but then not much responsiveness, especially on the part of government, because nationally we continue to be only 4% of the population. So people not understanding, the population also doubled in the decade between 1980 and 1990. So lots more people coming in largely through immigration and again needing more services but people not understanding how to provide them. The other part of the Asian Pacific Fund was a belief on the part of many people that especially fueled by the successes in Silicon Valley that there were many potential Asian donors who should be giving back it was time to try to get them involved and engaged in helping in, the, in these communities. So you had a concentration, regional concentrations of, of, of Asian communities, but not a national um, consciousness, nor even the, the, the political clout Correct. to necessarily create the attention on the issues uh, that affect uh, Asian communities. Is there also um, a, an issue uh, with the fact that the Asian community itself is, is a misnomer. It, 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 it denotes uh, a monolithic whole that doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. <laughs> yes, very true. I mean, um, I think in the last, in census 2010, they talked about 35 distinct ethnic groups and many more languages. And it is impossible to say really that there is an Asian ethnic community in, in a lot of ways it's a creature of the census itself. And it's East Asian and South Asian, so there are massive regional differences as well, as well as linguistic and, and other, and generational differences as generational, well. Generational, different migration patterns to the U.S. And um, one aspect that really affects philanthropy is that in the so-called homelands, many of them have been at war with one another. So the concept of trying to start an, an Asian charity where we're all kind of giving to one another also presents its own challenges. So starting a new organization is, is always a difficult thing. You start with, with an idea, and um, in general, when you start an organization, it's, it's the first several years you're, you're inventing. It's, it's a constant process of, of creating something out of nothing. Uh, talk with us a little bit about that process? Some of it is personal devotion and also the place where you are in your career. So I had done many jobs, some really interesting and challenging, like the child welfare system in New York City, and some not so rewarding. And those not so rewarding professional experiences remind you of why you work at all, that you want to do something where you feel like you're making a contribution and are capable of making change. And I knew the concept of the Asian Pacific Fund had value if we could actually execute. Um, so it was, it was a concept I really wanted to try to be engaged with. The intention was that we, I had done some volunteer work in the Asian community in New York and knew how hard it was to build trust across the ethnic groups. So in this case, I was working with people who were very much based in Chinatown mm -hmm. in Manhattan, and we were trying to uh, build coalitions with Koreans and Queens. And it takes time to do that. And so as a volunteer, I had that limited experience anyway. And I also knew that based on the numbers, we couldn't build a Chinese fund. It had to be Asian American. So the intention was, yes, we would try to be relevant to all the Asian ethnic groups, or at least the major ones, and to learn as we were going along what would actually motivate those Asian groups 
to be involved in the same enterprise. Now that's interesting to me. So, so you're, you're dealing with uh, geographic disparity from an ethnic point of view and a geographic reach between Queens and Manhattan mm -hmm. as well. So you, you take that and you see within that idea something that you can, in a sense, that experience was your pilot. Yes, that's true. And you, and you encountered many it. of the difficulties that, of, of trying to take an Asian collaborative approach as opposed to a Chinese-American approach or a Korean-American approach or a Japanese-American approach. Yes. It's true that that was the laboratory, but it, it didn't teach us everything we had to know. I mean, it, it was very clear that people identified with their own Asian ethnic group before they identified as Asian. Um, that there were real differences between immigrants and American-born, mm -hmm. regardless of your ethnic group. But some of it was really simple. Like in New York, I happened to have an office that was on a convenient subway line between Manhattan and Queens. So when we wanted to have meetings, I had a place, a place that was convenient for both in a neutral place. We didn't have to require that the Koreans came to Chinatown. So they're like, I know that sounds silly, but sometimes they were symbolic, you know, and logistical things that become very, very important. So were you Switzerland? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but so I also had no history in the, the old battles in Chinatown, of which there were many, many battles that I found to be very similar when I came to the West Coast. And so having no baggage helped as well. So you, you take some of these ideas, which are just gestating. You're not yet thinking about the Asian Pacific Fund. You find yourself now in San Francisco with its incredibly diverse um, Asian populations here. What then prompted that next step of taking that experience and converting it into an organization, investing in an organization? Well, there was first the opportunity that was presented to us by the United Way of the Bay Area because they, were, they had been looking at this concept for a year and had solicited some community support from local leaders and had committed some funding. And that's always very important. I mean, I didn't have to run around and find a few angel donors to say, let's get something started. So United Way, United Way is not necessarily always known for creating seed projects. So this was a seed project of the United Way. That's right. And the community leaders who were involved wanted to be independent of the United Way because they wanted to do their own leadership development. Those um, factors were already in place when I was interviewed for the job. And so, I, that, those were very important factors for me. I, I didn't want to run a project at the United Way. I wanted to try to start an organization. So it's interesting. So you have these series of activities that you've evolved in your career. And then you have this, this is, I guess, the luck that you were referring to before. You have this project that actually happens to align with that sensibility. Plus, the very important component where you didn't want to become part of the United Way and your donors or, or your prospective supporters did not want the organization to become part of United, United Way as well. That's right. So all that kind of fell into place. Mm -hmm. And there were two other pieces that were important. One was that um, three years prior, the United Way in New York had started a very similar organization. It continues to be run by an old friend. So I had actually kind of consulted for him in his early stages and had been thinking about this three years prior. And I was able to watch his development. Um, and that was a benefit for us. But the other real stroke of luck is that Chang Lin Tian joined our board. He's not as well known today as he was at that time, but he was the chancellor of UC Berkeley and the first Asian American to lead a major research university. So among Asian Americans, not just Chinese, he was a real hero. And he joined our board without ever asking who else is on the board. He said, I like this concept. This work needs to be done. I'm in. And then everybody wanted to join. I think that's a really interesting idea. What distinguishes a founding board member that, from somebody who joins a board of an organization that is already founded? Well, I think they are willing to take more risk because, um, and, and our organization was also unusual because as I understand it, most organizations that start, there are a few people who sit around, they know each other, they have some relationship, and they actually find that they have a shared commitment to the cause. And so they'll say, yeah, let's get together and start this organization. Um, and that was not our case. What we had was an organization external to the Asian community, namely the United Way, saying we think this thing ought to exist. 
So is the, is the first part of the journey to transform this from a, an organization that is external to the Asian community to an organization that is embraced by the Asian community? To some extent, but the people who helped us found it had to also give it a shape and a personality, a character. And that has been a slow process. It continues today. And the motivations of the different people, are there, are there different types of motivations um, amongst your, your founding board members and, and continuing to this day? Has that helped to evolve the, the organization in particular directions? I think it has. Um, and I, I guess I wouldn't be so presumptuous to say that I know all of the motivations for their joining a board. Having served on boards myself, I think that gave me another window on why people would join our kind of board and what kinds of people we're looking for. So there have been crucial times where our, our board has said, you know, we think this person's very successful. They bring a nice profile to the organization. But frankly, the ego there is just too big. And they're not going to work in the group. And so we've, you know, we've bypassed that person. Right. So they were looking for something in particular as a group, even though the group has changed. We have now established, I think, a board culture and personality. It's, it's an interesting idea that governance also includes shaping that board in a very deliberate way. I think it does, although I think you probably are giving us too much credit, at least in the first few years. Because we were, I looked around and, for example, I looked at the um, nonprofit organizations, the community-based organizations that were providing services to poor people, something we don't do. Right. We're raising money and making grants. And none of them in the Bay Area, many of them were already over 20 years old, actually had Pan-Asian boards. They describe their organizations as being Pan-Asian, but they might be dominated by all Japanese with maybe one Chinese person and one Vietnamese person. But they, were, they weren't genuinely Pan-Asian. So you're trying to, to develop, because you're a Pan-Asian organization, you're trying to develop a board that is Pan-Asian in character and a, and, and a series of programs that are Pan-Asian in character. Yes. And so we had to let that evolve. And it's not so easy. A, a lot of it embedded in the history of the um, the migration of Asians to America, that it's just you know, been in pieces, not one single flow. And so the character of those communities and the types of people who emigrated, the problems of their most vulnerable are actually quite different in character. And so to kind of get, expect them to all come together um, as a board, you know, was, you know, it took time. And then, of course, you, you're also, we were always, always looking for very successful leaders. And they're so busy being successful right. or building their careers to actually spend time in community was also an, another challenge. It continues to be a challenge. Talk a little bit about the challenges of, of raising funds for the Asian community as opposed to raising funds for the United Way or raising funds for the American Red Cross mm -hmm. or for, for an independent school. What are the challenges there? I think the two biggest ones are that the needs aren't very well understood. So one of the earliest things that we brought to public attention was that Asian elderly women have the highest suicide rate of any group in the country. And when you put that information out in front of people, they say, oh my god, I didn't know that. So is that the, need, the needs aren't understood by the prospective donors? Right, or the general public. But in our case, we're interested in communicating with prospective donors. Well, that's interesting. So people from the Asian community are, are being informed about the needs Oh, absolutely. Of the community as a whole. Yes, yes. And then, you know, there's that natural human reaction like, oh, I'm embarrassed by that. Right. I mean, people feel that way about domestic violence. Right. You know, we don't want to admit that it's happening. Um, so there's that kind of general challenge where you, we need to find useful information in small sound bites that can communicate well with individual donors. And then, of course, we have to offer them the solution. And, you know, we're raising money to support programs that are provided by community-based organizations. There are also many other problems that we can't intervene on uh, through that mechanism. So we have to kind of pick the problems that we raise to public attention. And I think the other is also giving the potential donors a sense that we really care about their community. Do you really understand it? Do you, are you making careful decisions when you make your uh, grant decisions. But it's really, do you, do you care about and understand my ethnic community? So in a sense, you're, you're also providing a service to, the, to those donors in that the donors are being informed, they're being educated yes. uh, on the, the issues that are confronting uh, their own communities. 
and, and you actually become an information clearinghouse in many respects, uh, analyzing the needs of the, uh, of the community for the community. We would love to be that. We still have a small staff, but yes, I mean, we like to be in that role. But the really useful information often doesn't get aggregated or it's, it's not easy, readily available. We could keep an analyst you know, uh, occupied full time just trying to get meaningful data. What's true about Asians across the issues is that we're kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So for example, nationally, we account for a higher proportion of all of college enrollment than is our representation of the population. We're barely 5%, closer to 4% of the national population, but we're 10% of the enrollment in, I think in all colleges or possibly the elite colleges. We're kind of overrepresented. But there are many Asian groups who have very high poverty rates and are vastly underrepresented in the college population. So for example, Filipinos are a special admissions group at UC Berkeley, right? That would surprise most people, meaning special, um, they get special consideration because they are underrepresented on the campus, right? Even though they kind of have an, an average household income and a very populous group in, among the Asian ethnic groups. So there are th things that are a little puzzling. You have to dig carefully at the data and try to understand the real nature of the problem. Um, and, but there are still needs, needs that need to be addressed. But you have to be careful when you're trying to define what the problem is and what the solution ought to be. Is the organization going to scale? Is it going to expand in terms of geographic range into different areas uh, of the country? Um, are there new programs that you'd like to, to develop that you don't currently have? We would love to expand, but I think our board has wisely and consistently said, you know, we're 17 years old now, but they say, we want to be able to do this right in this region. And we all know that philanthropy is very personal and yeah. often very local. And so we still feel, of course, that there are uh, real fundraising uh, potential. There is fundraising potential here in the Bay Area that we haven't reached the full potential. And we started building an endowment in now 10 years ago. And we've, you know, we've made progress. We know uh, what it will take to make the uh, foundation permanent, which is a $20 million endowment. And we're, a little, we're almost halfway there now. So that's great. From, from, from zero through founding, through establishment of the programs, through the next phase of, of sort of building out those programs and now into this sort of stabilization plan. Is your board also transforming in, in this process as well? I think they have. I mean, we, we all have to step up to the plate. So in particular, the management of a foundation that has an endowment is frankly different from just, you know, a year by year modest sized grant making organization. So we've purposely sought leadership that can help us manage more money and to be smarter at working with the bankers and the, you know, the portfolio managers. And they being um, functioning at a higher level at the staff capacity is also very, very important. So we've always tried to appeal to um, high net worth individuals and larger donors because it was the, we knew that was the faster way to build the foundation. And those donors require, not because they're fussy or demanding, larger gifts require a higher level of expertise to manage. So you're also building your capacity yes. to respond to your donors. Have and to. and uh, just just one last question, and that is about the importance of the relationships that you have with other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. uh, because you do have, uh, you have established quite a significant relationship with a number of different nonprofits. Could you talk a little bit about um, that from, from your founding with, uh, yes. with United Way and now today uh, where you're located, uh, you're, you're, you're co-located with uh, the San Francisco Foundation and there, there are other organizations that, have, that you've worked with. How, how have you developed those relationships? Well, that's an area where I would like to have done more, actually. I mean, the, many of our colleagues um, who are trying to build community foundations that are focused on a particular population, women's groups, gay and lesbian groups, Latinos, et cetera, they have they often do collaborations with one another and we've did a little of that work in the early years um, very often their focal point is um, joint projects that change the behavior of foundations and corporations and we haven't spent much time at that and some a lot of it is because Asians kind of come last in that list you know we can't make a case on our own 
we're always going to be behind those other ethnic groups, all of whom have very legitimate issues and concerns. And, um, and often our issues are different. So it's hard to work in that kind of collaboration if you don't feel the same sense of return on investment. Um, we, so we haven't done a lot of work there. We have built a lot of relationships with the local Asian organizations because there we have more shared interests and we are very reliant on the community-based organizations to help make us smart about issues. They're the people on the ground who really know what's going on. So it's the dialogue with the people who are working within the different Asian communities yes. and, and creating that support. Do you find it useful in terms of, of creating an awareness of the Asia, Asian Pacific Fund's uh, uh, place within the community? Are they, are, are, do, do these organizations that have their own funding needs become supporters of the, uh, of, of the value that you, that you bring? Or are, do you have like a coopetition kind of a, kind of a thing? I think there was a fear when we started many years ago that there would be a competition, but we've, we don't feel that now, and I don't think others do either. Um, we, when we started the organization, we actually visited, I visited all the agencies. There were 50 at the time, now there are 90 who are uh, kind of formally affiliated with us. And I asked them what a big donor was to them, and they said $500. So I said, fine, we'll go for $1,000 plus as a first gift. And we've always stayed focused on that. Now, they have, you know, they've matured and they, they do raise major gifts themselves, but I think they understand the type of donor we're trying to appeal to. Many of our donors have actually not heard of any of the organizations we're supporting. They want to be connected to the Asian community, but they don't have a vehicle for getting there. And so and we become, become, yeah, become the vehicle. We become the vehicle. Um, the other area that I do want to mention that we haven't had much involvement in that I think it has great potential is uh, doing a, a more policy work so that these the issues that face Asian Americans can be better understood and then that the information gets disseminated to the people who need to see it. And some of that has to happen through national collaborations, but we have not been able to staff for that so far. This is a great uh, contribution to the nonprofit field. This, it's an important area. It's an underrepresented area. It is an organization that is making a substantial difference to so many people's lives. Thank you so much. Thank for you. sharing with us your insights. Thank, Thank you. you.